Take a breather. <laughs> <laughs> You're terrific. I love you. And I'm so appreciative of your openness and honesty. And I know our viewers are, too. Um, two things. One, just with reference to the Hollywood era in the days of the 40s, some people might be interested in knowing what was it like just uh, from the perspective of a young girl going there. Was it Tinsel City, unreal, or was it something that really was the glamorous thing that you thought it would be? Oh, it was everything. It was more than you... Remember now where I'm coming from. This is the world that I gave my life for. Like you give your life for God. I sold everything. This was it. And it was it. At that time, there were orange groves still. It was gorgeous. It wasn't ugly. And it, we're there... Let me just interrupt. In all of this, in that tinsel town, in that paradise that you described, mm -hmm. Was there any person or persons, or any, are there any happy memories of that time that you have? No. Hmm. No, I'm sorry to say. I really was, it was funny, once I got to Hollywood, I loved Broadway, I loved the stage, I understood what I was doing, I understood this. That was approval and that was love. I think, I think just now I'm real, that was where it went wrong. It was silent out there. You know, I would do a funny thing, and nothing happened. I would sing a song, and nothing happened. See, this was love. Mm -hmm. That was approval, and I had none of it. And the terror began. I didn't know if I was good. I, you don't know where you're at when you come from the stage. It's really tough. I'm sure people who remember you as I do, I mean, I think I saw Annie get your gun seven times. Every, <laughs> every dancing recital, I try to sing anything oh. you can do, I can do better. <laughs> and I wanted to be like Betty Hutton. Well, try it now. No. Oh. <laughs> Are you kidding? Uh, but when people hear someone like you talking about fear, uh, it's, it's, all, it's very hard to think that you could do all that you did and keep going with fear. But I, I think any performer will tell you that they have fear. But mine grew. It grew like a monster. I don't think there were, there were many people there who had the kind of fear that I had. And maybe it's because, going back to the Broadway thing, she took the one song away. You know, that fear is there that any minute they're going to pull a rug out and it's going to be gone. And I didn't have... And then have, you have nothing? Is that it? Not, and I had nothing because there was no applause yeah. anymore. Matter of fact, I, I, I wrote, I said, there it goes, up and up and up. I called it backstage. You can have that huge, fantastic curtain. You stand and stare at utter disbelief. The dream world you lived for, lived in and fought for is no longer a dream. It's true. It's happening and it's happening to you. No more nightmares, no more frights. From now on, your world will be a world filled with beautiful lights, pinks, magentas, and soft blues. You will never have to look back. But what you don't know yet, because you're oh so young, is that it really doesn't matter whether that curtain is going up or coming down. It marks the beginning of an inside terror that only God in all his mercy will finally ring down. Betty, when did it begin to slip away really beyond control? What year was it when you were hitting bottom? And tell us a little bit how you came out of it. Well, I hit bottom in New England. That was the bottom when I bottomed out with suicide. But it started, of course, in Vegas, as I told you. You see, I, they had taken me to the silent era so long that this was terrifying. And the hours were crazy, but I already told you all about yes. that. But I think when I, got to, when I got to New England and they took me to the alcoholic place, you know, to get me off the pills, I was, I think, four or five days off of pills. And I saw a man walk in, a priest, and he had the most drunken, horrific woman with him you've ever seen. And only someone who knows alcohol knows the monster that that is because they're not, they're not responsible for what's going on. But I, I looked at this man, I thought, oh, wonderful, a Catholic priest. What, any minute he's going to blow here, scream, you know, because she was ridiculous. I never heard such garbage come out of a woman's mouth, and I thought I had heard it all. And this man just stood there and just kept saying, Pearl, it's okay. It's all, and he kept holding her as she, the, I cannot tell you how awful what she was saying even to my horrendous ears, you know. And the nurse finally got up behind her to give her a shot, you know. And they calmed her down, and father left and went out the door, and 
she came out of that shot and hit to that one and tried to break through the window to get to him and I thought this man I've got to meet and right then and there I had a feeling that God was saying to me okay Betty it's time so I waited till she sobered up and I went to her and I simply said Pearl who is that man and she began to tell me about Father McGuire how he reaches in and takes care of people that no one wants to handle because when I got there father my children had not spoken to me in four years nobody wanted I couldn't get arrested literally nobody wanted me mm -hmm. I couldn't do a show and my reputation was really that bad but nobody spoke to me anymore there wasn't one friend left I had done that with the pills I really was sick Mm -hmm. There was no one to talk to anymore, and only anger came out, because mm -hmm. I was very angry. And I had nobody to, to say, uh, look, I'm dying inside, help me. Mm -hmm. And I had a feeling, it was, I'm sorry, that it would be Father. So I right. talked with Pearl, and she took me to my first Mass in, in Massachusetts. And we went into the most huge, the hugest church I'd ever been in, and there were about three people there. It was not, not a Sunday Mass. And the priest, I had always been terrified because they always had their back to you, you know. And he motioned for us to, I thought, oh, what's the matter? What have we yeah. done? I said, Pearl, what's the matter? And she said, I don't know. Because this hadn't happened with her either. So we went up there. We stood by the, the blessed sack with the wine. And the, it wasn't terrifying. That's why God had that happen that way to me. This priest was so lovely. And we just stood right there with the tears flowing down my face. I couldn't receive communion, but I was allowed to stand there and watch it. You know, it wasn't something you can't see. And now I know how alive this religion is. Cause I thought it was behind clouds, you know, dark curtains and outfits you couldn't get in. And it's just simple. So and you saw Father McGuire? Yes, and the, uh, she was his cook. Hmm. So when she went back, she uh, asked me if I'd come with her, not that day, but she said if it works out, you know. So after Pearl left, I got to go to, to Father McGuire's, rec it was the first rectory that he'd handled too. And he didn't know who Betty Hutton was, which is funny. <laughs> they said to him, you know, that's Betty Hutton. He said, so? <laughs> You know, that's how we, I think I got, well, I didn't have to do anything for him. No performing. He'd never seen me in a picture, didn't know what that was all about. And the healing began. It's taken me 10 years to get this far. It wasn't sudden, but it was slow, but it was wonderful. And now I work with people that were as sick as I was. That's it's what's so marvelous, that all those great gifts that you have have now moved out. Talk a little bit about the kind of person who comes to you for help or how you talk to the young people how you get in touch with them well I go I go to lots of colleges and schools where they have a lot of problems but mainly around where I work with people that nobody else wants to work with the lost causes but I think the main work I do that you would hear about is with young people because when you can tell them where that's at with drugs and the, the pot and all the where it's going to take them they will listen to me where they would not listen to the priest or no matter how correct they are it has to come from somebody who's been there mm -hmm. and there is a different tone to it it doesn't mean that you have any superior knowledge your only knowledge is because you've suffered it you know and that's what they listen to betty you just exude a kind of um uh energy quite different from that which I associated with you, you know, so many years ago. Uh -huh. What is the source of that now? It's certainly not performing. It's certainly not phony. No. It, well, I was telling some of your staff, it's Christian confidence. <laughs> it's God. It, he, I live for him totally every moment of my life, whether I'm playing on Broadway. I did Annie, you know, a couple of years ago. It doesn't matter what form of, uh, that it takes now. I take him out there with me. And I say, okay, let's roll, God, because he's with me. And it's terrific, because it's not a God. Jesus, to me, is so personal. You know, when I found out he would listen to me, you know, how can you ever explain to anybody that you're that special? You're not that special to any human, but you are that special to him, and that's what's brought me through all of this.